Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support in making the Signature Lecture Series a success. I'd also like to, Bals to thank the Balsley School of International Affairs for co-sponsoring this evening's event. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from the audience. If you're here at CG, you can ask your questions at the microphones down the side and the volunteers will help. And if you're watching online, you can ask questions through the live chat function on your screen. And we'll transmit those questions to our speaker on the screen here. This evening, we pick up on an important topic that we at CG have been examining for some time now. In fact, we studied this theme in great depth only uh, two weeks ago at the CG12 annual conference here in Waterloo called Five Years After the Fall, The Governance Legacies of the Global Financial Crisis. During those discussions, we heard how interconnected and yet complex and muddied the global economy really is. Five years after what Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney called the biggest economic and financial shock we'll ever see in our lifetime, Many experts continue to argue that we're not much better off than when the financial system first collapsed. And so we ask ourselves, will the crisis ever end? And to answer that question tonight, we're pleased to have with us as a speaker, the very distinguished Olivier Blanchard of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and he'll be introduced uh, more properly now by David Johnson, professor of economics at Wilfrid Laurier University and an education policy scholar with the C.D. Howe Institute. Please help me to welcome Professor Johnson. Well, I am very pleased to welcome Olivier Blanchard to Waterloo to speak to us today. As you are aware, Professor Blanchard, as Director of Research at the International Monetary Fund, has spent the last few years providing advice and wise counsel as the world has endured and is enduring the largest economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And I'm certainly looking forward to his insights on this issue. I do find the title of the talk, Will the Crisis Ever End?, a little bit on the depressing side. And I suspect Olivier might feel that way some days. Uh, Olivier Blanchard is one of the best macroeconomists in the world. He's worked on a wide variety of fascinating issues in asset and in labor markets, and uh, in my area made several substantial contributions to macroeconometrics. Among the economists from my generation, and a few younger than that, he may well be best known as the co-author with Stan Fisher of the leading graduate macro text, Lectures on Macroeconomics. I looked up its publication date, first published in 1989, and I still see people using it today. Uh, it's a book that has spawned many a thesis over many years, I suspect. Early in my career, I was very privileged and glad when Olivier agreed to add his helpful counsel to my thesis committee, and it was much improved by his input. I first met Olivier when I was a first year graduate student taking his monetary economics course in the spring of 1980. He was an assistant professor at Harvard. It was an amazing course and is certainly part of the reason I have a lifelong interest in macroeconomics. Every year when I teach my macroeconomics course, uh, graduate macroeconomics course at Laurier, and the, enough of them are here, they can say this is true, I ask students to state in turn what was the best economics course they ever took and why. And then I answer the same question myself, and I'm ready to, to answer that question. And my answer is always that the monetary economics course taught by Olivier Blanchard was the best economics course I have ever taken. I never left one of his lectures without learning something. I always knew why the something I learned was important, and I was always motivated by the insight and presentation to work hard to master whatever skill or skills was introduced in that lecture. And for the graduate students in this crowd, they know that often those skills are hard to master, and rarely, if ever, do they come on your first try. But I always knew why I wanted to do it, and I knew that I wanted to do it. And there was no better experience as a student to understand that you want to learn a skill and then be motivated to do it. That's superb teaching. And Olivier was exactly that person for me and for a generations of graduate students at Harvard and MIT and I look forward to learning from him tonight.
Good. Uh, David, thank, thank you very much for the very kind words. Uh, let me also say how pleased I am to, uh, to come here at uh, CG. Uh, I asked the uh, External Relations Department at the IMF uh, what they thought about CG before I came, and they said it was probably the most influential, uh, I don't know, think tank or institution in, in Canada. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, but I'm, I'm especially happy to, uh, to, to see David again. I mean, he didn't say this, but we've spent uh, most of the last year, year and a half, uh, co-authoring uh, the uh, new edition of my undergrad uh, textbook. And we've done this entirely by email. And so I, I see him for the first time uh, in many years. And I now know he exists. I've seen him in the flesh. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, see him and then to uh, see Susan as well. What I thought I would do, well, one more remark. I may have chosen the title, uh, uh, you know, when will the crisis end, but I don't remember. I think somebody made it up <laughs> in order to attract the audience. Uh, I have a much more neutral and actually a, a less pessimistic view of things, which is uh, better reflected by this rather uh, neutral title here. Uh, but I, I thought what I would do would be to... Um, take one step back from you know, what, what is in the newspapers every day, you know, what happened in Greece yesterday and so on, and try to, to talk about uh, the, the forces I see behind the, uh, the evolution of, of the world economy over the last uh, four years, since the beginning of the crisis. And then having done this, uh, being able to talk about what I see as the right policies, which is very much my job uh, every day, and then try to give you a sense of where we might be going from, from here. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, it's clearly a lot of uh, terrain to cover, but uh, I'm going to do my best. So le let me start with uh, a sense of the landscape. There are, there are many numbers here. Uh, these are the forecasts uh, that we produced uh, uh, last October. Uh, for 2012, mostly. I mean, the part of the year was already uh, well, uh, well in play, and 2013. And there are many numbers that we, I, I could talk about, but what I want to emphasize is the following, which is that if you look at uh, the advanced countries, so the US, the Euro, uh, and Japan, then you see extremely low growth, both in 2012 and in 2013. Indeed, you see negative growth for the euro area in 2012 and, and you know, basically zero for 2013. So that's the first fact. The advanced countries are really uh, growing very, very slowly, despite the fact that there is clearly a large gap to be filled. There is a high level of unemployment, and so you'd expect strong growth, not, or you'd hope for strong growth, not, not weak growth. That's the first thing. The, the second thing I want you to, to notice is the revision in this forecast relative to where we thought we would, what would happen a year earlier. So this is the, the, the third line in each of the two uh, panels for 2012-2013. And what I want you to look at is basically the news for the US, not much revision, uh, but for the euro uh, area, a substantial revision downwards. Basically, we were not expecting uh, that uh, growth would be negative. So this is also something quite important. Then the third point I want you to get from this is if you look on the right-hand side, uh, EMs means emerging markets, and LICs means uh, low-income countries. And what you see here are growth rates which are substantially higher than in advanced countries, but historically are not very high. And in particular, what I want to, uh, to, to notice is actually the fairly sharp revision in the growth of emerging markets. Uh, both for 2012 and 2013. These are the, the, the circles of the ellipsoids on, on the right. So these three facts, low growth, revised down in advanced countries, especially in the euro, and then uh, things not so good uh, in emerging markets. So the, the challenge of that lecture is to try to make some sense of these numbers. I see slides, I think that some of them can be skipped. So this one I'm going to skip because I don't think it makes more of a point than the previous one. So the, the story that I'm going to tell uh, is that the problem is in advanced countries. 
it is affecting emerging market countries, it is affecting the rest of the world, but the problem is really uh, in advanced countries and, and very, much, very much in Europe, but not only in Europe. And the challenge is something that you probably have read about in newspapers. It's how to achieve fiscal consolidation, which I should argue is, is actually needed. We start from very high levels of debt, while sustaining growth so that fiscal consolidation doesn't lead to recession because we've learned that this is really, a problem, is really a problem. And to a large degree, this is the problem of every single advanced economy at this point. More so in some countries, more so in Greece, more so in Spain, less so in the US, even less so in Germany. But it is really the, the central issue, how to achieve fiscal consolidation while making sure that we don't get into a, a, a bad recession. Now, this, to show you the, the challenge, and this is probably one of the scariest slides uh, in, the, in the presentation, I want to show you an episode where a government decided to do fiscal consolidation, and it turned out to be a nightmare. Now, in order to avoid politically sensitive issues, I went back one century, <laughs> right? And I went back to uh, after World War I, for the UK, uh, and this is, to those of you who do economics, it's known as the Churchill versus Keynes uh, debate. So Churchill was in charge, and during the war, what you have on the left-hand side is the primary budget balance. The primary budget is the budget net of interest payments. Okay? Now, during the war, obviously, the UK had you know, run very large deficits. This is what countries do during wars, and so Churchill came and decided that he basically had to turn these deficits into surpluses in order to stabilize and then decrease the debt, right? So he went at it, and as you can see, the primary deficit, so the beginning of a red curve, you know, is minus, more than minus 20% of GDP, so enormous deficit. The war ends, so clearly a lot of spending stops because it's no longer needed, but he runs for about, from 1918 to 1933, he runs primary surpluses of close to 10% on average. Very, very large primary surpluses. So very virtuous. Now you say, well, virtue should be rewarded. And unfortunately, it's not. And that's one of the lessons of economics. Look at the middle graph. So it gives you the ratio of government debt, right, as a ratio to GDP. And as you can see, during the war, it increases very much from 40% at the beginning of the war to 150% uh, at the end of the war, roughly, or 140%, right? But what happens after? Despite the fact that there's a primary surplus, uh, the, the, the debt continues to increase, right? And as you can see, basically it reaches 200% of GDP, and when we come to the mid-30s, uh, it is around 200%. How can this be? Well, the problem is that the fiscal consolidation leads to an enormous recession, which kills GDP, right? And that's, that's basically what you see in the last graph, which is, as you can see, real GDP drops like a stone after the war and then slowly recovers. So what the government is trying to do is to improve the fiscal position, but it's creating an economic situation which is so bad that the final result is actually a large increase in debt. Now, clearly, not a great performance. You end up with more debt and you end up with a very major recession. Now, for those of you who know about that episode, there was more than that. There was a return to the gold standard and various other things. But the point is there, which is that if you try to do fiscal consolidation in the wrong way, when the, the rest of the money is not there, you get a recession and you don't succeed. You get the recession and you don't decrease debt. So let me now move and just try to analyze what's going on behind the slow growth in advanced economies, and then I'll turn to emerging markets more briefly. Okay. So this is, I said the previous graph was the scariest, this probably true, this is the second scariest. Uh, I think it gets better after that. But this, this, I think, a very important lesson of history, which is that what we've gone through is a financial crisis. Right, started as a very intense financial crisis in 2008, 2009. But there has been many financial crises in history, many in emerging markets in Latin America and elsewhere, but some in advanced countries. And so we can say, well, looking at the financial crisis which took place in advanced economies, right, how long did it take for employment 
to return to its peak level. So what this does is to show you the deviation of employment from the peak level, so which is before the crisis, presumably, or just at the beginning, okay, uh, as a function of time and on the horizontal axis are years. Right? So what this does is look at the five most recent advanced economy financial crises. So there's Sweden, there's Finland, there's uh, Spain a while back, and so on. Okay? Uh, this is the green line. Look at how long it took for employment to return to its, its, to its uh, pre-crisis pre peak level, right? 17 years. So this is an indication that financial crises are not easy, easy to handle. They, they are very hard to handle. If you look at the Great Depression, which is the, the yellow line, which we know was abominable, okay, it only took about eight to 10 years to actually return to peak employment, right? So this is history. Now, we don't have to repeat history, but this is history, and it tells us it's going to be hard. The current evolution of employment in the US is the red line. If you invite me in uh, 16 years, I'll be able to draw the whole line, but can't quite do it yet. We're four years into it, right? So it's just the four, first four years. And as you can see, employment is still far lower than the peak, um, about by three, three million at this point. Uh, looking at, at the numbers uh, last month. So you can see that it's, it's a challenge. It's always a challenge in financial crisis, and that, that one is no exception. We hopefully will do much better than the green line, but uh, this is still a, a fairly strong warning. The, the, the question is, okay, so why is it that it's so hard uh, for, for countries to get back to health uh, after a financial crisis? And there you have to dig deeper. So this is what comes next. What I'm going to argue, it's going to be mechanical, but probably easy to, to think about, is when you think about growth in a country, you have factors which are pushing, which are increasing growth, pushing growth up, and then you have factors which are pulling down, so call the first ones accelerators, the second one breaks. And what I'm going to argue is that we are in a configuration in which there is a very strong accelerator, which is monetary policy, and if we didn't use the brakes, we would be going at very, very fast speed. Uh, but there are breaks. Uh, there are breaks which are the legacy of what we had done before the crisis, what we did during the beginning of the crisis. And the three breaks that I'm going to talk about are the fiscal break, fiscal consolidation. So this was something I've already talked about. Uh, the second is the financial break, which is that the financial system in many countries has been badly hit and is weak, and therefore credit is hard to get and so on. And the third one, is uncertainty, which is, you know, we don't quite know where we're going, and there are a lot of sources of uncertainty. And in a context like this, you might be very careful if you're a firm or if you're a consumer to spend. You may want to just be careful and see what happens. And that's clearly also playing a role. So you have, on the one hand, you have my policy, and then on the other, you have these free breaks. The result is what we see. So in thinking about, you know, what happens in the future, we have to say, are the breaks going to be loser? Is the accelerator going to continue to be there and then uh, draw, the, draw the sum of When I've done this, then I'll talk about the effects on emerging markets, which is very relevant, and then uh, about policies. So, accelerator. That's a part of a story that you probably know quite well, which is that in this crisis, I think central banks learned a lesson from previous crises. And when demand decreased very sharply and, and, and people didn't want to consume, the central banks did everything they could to try to sustain demand. Okay, so the first thing they did was to decrease what we call the policy rates, which is the rates that they control. So this is what you have on the left-hand side. Okay, so in the, in the US, it would be the federal funds rate. Uh, and what they did was that these rates were you know, around 4, 5, 6% before the crisis. They decreased the rate to zero. So if you could borrow at that rate, you could actually borrow at zero. The problem they ran into uh, in 2009 uh, was that when you're at zero, you can't go negative, right? This is uh, the zero bound, and it's an issue. It's called the liquidity trap, right? They, 
they decided, well, they could do more because, yes, the policy rate was zero, but some other rates maybe uh, were not equal to zero. So they intervened in other markets than the ones they usually intervene. Uh, they bought what these things call MBSs, which are mortgage-based securities. They did various things, many different incarnations, but basically they decided, well, if we can't get that rate down, uh, let's try to get other rates down. Let's make sure that, you know, people, specific types of firms or categories of firms can actually borrow. So that's what you have on the right. When you do this, you actually increase the money supply substantially. So just visually, this shows you that they increased their balance sheet, namely the amount of money in the, uh, in the economy, by an enormous amount, triple uh, in some cases and so on. So here, the point is, and that's still going on. So this accelerator is there, right? If there were no breaks, uh, if I had told you four years ago that, for example, the U.S. Fed would promise to keep the interest rate at more or less zero for another three or four years, you would have said this is going to lead to an enormous boom. I mean, borrowing at zero is very appealing. There are many things you can do at that. Uh, and I th I'm sure we would have seen an enormous boom. Uh, the problem is, again, that there have been breaks, and so there's this tug of war between the two. But it's there, and I think that's one reason to be relatively optimistic, because it is there, uh, it is, in many, for, many, in many, from, for many people, it is fairly cheap to borrow, and therefore, eventually, it will, it will have more of an effect. Okay, let me now turn to the breaks. <clears throat> so this is, this is if, I to, if I were to fully explain it, a very complex slide, but it shows the challenge of fiscal consolidation, how much has to be done, right? So at this stage, most countries are running large deficits, even large primary deficits, leaving aside uh, the interest payments. Okay? In order to stabilize that, at this stage, debt is still increasing, right? In order to stabilize that, they have to move from primary deficits to primary surpluses. Stabilizing debt is good, but not great. I mean, you probably don't want to stabilize debt at 100% of GDP because it's very dangerous, right? So you probably want to get it down. So this computation says, suppose that we want these countries to be back to 60% debt to GDP ratio in 2030, right? It's a long time away, it gives time. 60% uh, was what was thought to be safe before. I think it's still dangerous, but let's try to do this. By how much do they have to change? their primary balance from the deficit they have to the surplus they need to achieve in order to generate this decrease in debt, right? So that's the computation. And these bars show the size of the adjustment which has to take place. Between now, 20, between, not exactly now, between 2010, so two years ago, and 2020, okay? Now, if you look at this, this is extremely scary. Um, Greece, you know, uh, is in trouble. Uh, but if you look at the adjustment, it has to increase its primary balance by basically 21% of GDP. Now, these are very, very large amounts. Now, you can play, this is, you know, this is not a simple computation, so you can play with it, and maybe it's only 18, maybe it's only 15, but these are very, very large numbers. The other country which people don't talk about enough is Japan. Japan is also has a very high level of debt, and actually, for that computation, we don't even assume that they go back to 60%, because it would lead to an enormous number. We ask them to go back to 80%. And still, they need to do more than 20% of GDP. So these are just enormous adjustments, right? Um, if you do it over 10 years, for example, 20%, you have to do 2% every year more, which is politically very, very difficult. So you, you can see, and you, but you can see that for some countries, and Germany at the bottom, for example, this is not a major issue. Uh, but for some countries, it is a se fairly serious issue. The U.S. Is, is fairly high up there. Okay. What's the difference between red and blue? Blue is what has been, what has been done already, and red is what remains to be done. Right? So, as you can see here, Greece has done a whole lot. Right? I mean, in terms of adjustment, fiscal adjustment, they had no choice. They were basically in a program in which the financing would only come if they had a really tough fiscal consolidation, so they have done it. Again, output is not great, but in terms of fiscal consolidation, they did a lot. The country which is a bit worrisome is Japan. 
where, in effect, they have gone away. They have done not only zero, but negative. That's largely due to the earthquake, which basically has led them to have fiscal stimulus for a while, which they can't avoid. But then they have a long way to go. Right? So the point here is that if we want to get back to reasonable levels of debt in finite time, 2030 is a long time away, uh, then it's going to take an enormous fiscal effort. Many of the countries, you can see, many of the, bars, the blue bars are large. Many of these countries are going at it. But this is, although it's needed, in the short run, what this means is either you increase taxes and people spend less, or you decrease spending and there is less demand. So in the short run, there is basically no question that this decreases output. This leads other things equal to lower growth. And if you do too much of it, to recession. So this is the first break. And that's a break which is going to be on that car for a really long time. So I said something which needs to be documented. I think most of you will take, you, take it at face value, but this has been very much discussed by policymakers, which is some policymakers have said, well, if you do fiscal consolidation, yes, I mean, taxes are going to increase, people are going to spend less, but you have other effects. You have confidence will come back, and people will feel better about the future. So in the end, maybe it actually doesn't decrease demand. It actually increases demand. And I think what this crisis has shown is that confidence may indeed be affected, but it is not strong enough. And therefore, what you get is that if you do more fiscal consolidation, you actually get less growth. What this is, and again, this is a complex slide. I'm going to give you the essence of it. This looks at the forecast errors of growth in 2010, 2011. Why? Because this is the time when there was a lot of fiscal consolidation. Right? And it looks at the relation of this to the planned fiscal consolidation as of 2010. Now, in principle, if people forecasting in 2010 had done a correct job, there should be no relation between the planned fiscal consolidation and the forecast error. They should not have made a systematic error. What you find here, this line, which is downward sloping, says that they made a systematic error, basically, for 1% more f planned fiscal consolidation, the forecast error was 1%, which means that if a country was planning to consolidate by, say, 2%, then growth turned out to be 2% less than anticipated. And the interpretation of this is that the forecasters, and this includes the IMF, probably used two small multipliers. They assumed that the effect of fiscal consolidation would not be that bad. It turned out to be very bad. So this is just, again, more directed at people who are you know, in macroeconomics. Uh, but the general point is fiscal consolidation is needed, but in the short run, and the short run is going to last for a while, right, it is going to slow down growth and quite substantially, right? So this is the first break. The second break is the financial system, and that's a characteristic of financial crisis. And basically, the, uh, the financial system stopped working uh, in 2008, 2009. We all know about the Lehman uh, crisis. We know about the, uh, all the problems which, which arose at the time. And it has slowly recovered, uh, but in many cases, it is not yet in good shape. So what this does is show you an index of bank lending conditions. So when it goes up, right, it says banks are tightening credit. So any point above the horizontal axis is tightening credit. Any point below is loosening credit. Now, look at the United States, okay? So in the United States, you can see that the Lehman crisis led to an enormous tightening, right? You have this very large increase, right? Then it comes down, but remember, you're still above the line, which is that it continues to tighten. As long as it's above the line, it continues to tighten. So basically, there's been more or less continuous tightening in the US from you know, the beginning of the crisis to uh, 2010. Now, since then, you see that we've gone below the line, which is that slowly US banks, which are in better shape, are starting to lend more, right? Are more willing to basically offer credit to people who are not quite as, as reliable as before. Okay. But you can see that there's a long way to go before we have canceled the whole increase 
right? And so we're not there yet. And then if you look at the euro area, you can see that things are worse there, which is that there has been continuous tightening. Again, it was very strong during the Lehman part, right? But all the points are above the axis, which means that there's continuing tightening. Uh, now, that hides a bit the fact that it's more true in South Europe than North Europe, but on average, that's what it is. So what you have is banks which are not in great shape, are unwilling to basically lend, unless you're a really good risk, or lend to you at a very high rate. And that, again, is a very strong break on growth. Uh, banks have to get back to, to health, and they're not there yet. <coughs> so this shows you actually some lending rates, so the rate at which if you were a small uh, firm and you wanted to borrow a million euros for one year from a bank, this is the rate that you would get today. And the point I want to make is the, the blue line at the bottom is the rate that the central bank of the euro, the ECB, is setting. So the central bank has basically decreased the rate not quite to zero, but nearly to zero, right? Well, if you could borrow at that rate, it would be attractive except that you can't, right? In these countries, you can see that you can only borrow at a much higher rate. The two countries at the bottom are Germany and France. I don't know how good you are with flags, uh, but these you probably know, right? And it's not so bad. You know, it's about 2% more than the policy rate. But then if you look at the others, like the next two, uh, which are uh, Portugal, uh, which are Spain and Italy, then you can see that if you're a small firm, it's still very expensive to borrow. Right? I mean, you basically have rates which are around 6%, and there is no inflation, so it's, it's, a, it's a fairly high rate. So this is a second break, and as long as the banks are not repaired, right, uh, then things are not going to, uh, to be better at that margin. So third break, uncertainty. I think uncertainty is always very important and uh, actually difficult to capture, difficult to measure, but it has been very, it has been very important. There is no question, for example, that in, uh, in the fall of 2008, uh, there was uncertainty about whether the world was going to continue. I mean, just what we call Knightian uncertainty, just complete disarray, intellectual disarray, but in this case, you're incredibly careful, right? I think that went away, partly. We understood that the financial system was not going to explode, we could repair it. But there has been a lot of uncertainty, I think, in the recent past about policy. So to take two examples, which are the two important examples, right? in the US, the so-called fiscal cliff. Is Congress, and the president, uh, is Congress and the president going to agree to basically reduce the fiscal deficit when, how? Uh, if they do nothing, could it be that we're going to get an enormous contraction, fiscal contraction, early next year? If you're a firm, you're quite careful about what you're going to do. Uh, in Europe, it's a whole Greek mess, uh, which, you know, in which people have a sense that Europe just can't quite take the right decisions, never take them in time, and so on and so on. So again, if you're a firm in Greece or elsewhere, you're very careful about basically investing. You want to know what's going to happen before you do anything. That's perfectly rational from your point of view. But clearly, if everybody does this, then you get a recession, which is, uh, which is, which is what, what we are seeing. So these are indices of political uncertainty. I'm not going to tell you how they are constructed. Uh, but if you look at the euro area, you can see that, which is this one, you can see that it basically is fairly high. It is uh, nearly as high as it has been throughout the crisis. In the, in the US, it's much less obvious. The fiscal cliff is very much in the newspapers, but not yet seen as, as, as a very big issue, but it's probably there anyway. This is, again, for those of you who, who are more into it, but let me just mention it, which is that there is an index called the VIX in the US and the VIX stocks in Europe, which basically measures from the stock market the prices of the options in the stock market, the degree of uncertainty of actual investors. So this is something which is traded. And typically in times of uncertainty, this goes up a lot because people basically want to protect themselves against events that, uh, that, that they, they worry about. This is represented, the evolution is represented by the green line. And the puzzle here, I present this as a puzzle, is that there is absolutely no evidence that at least in the stock market, 
uncertainty affects uh, behavior very much. So the point I'm making here, I think, is well, two points. The first one is uncertainty surely matters, but it's very difficult to capture exactly what effect it has on what. But it is clearly a break as well. So I've shown you one accelerator, three breaks. This is it for advanced economies for the time being. Let me now turn to the rest of the world, uh, emerging markets uh, and, 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 and low-income countries, and basically show you two things. So, again, complicated graph, but simple message, which is that there are two ways in which what happens in advanced countries affects poor countries, emerging markets. These, the main ones are China, India, and so on, uh, Brazil. Two ways. The first one is trade, which is that when things are bad in our countries, trade exports to our countries goes down, but these, these are their exports, and this affects basically production there. That's a very strong effect, much stronger than we thought before the crisis. And the other is capital flows. So let me talk about the first one. So this basically, I mean, again, get a visual impression, because I don't, don't want to describe the, the, the graph in detail. It basically gives a relation between unexpected growth in a particular country and unexpected growth in the countries with which it trades, in the advanced countries in which it trades. So the idea is if the countries with which you trade, to which you export, are doing poorly, then your exports are going to do poorly, and you would expect that as a result you're going to have less growth, right? So you would expect this positive relation between the two, basically. Less growth abroad, less growth at home. As you can see, these are all the countries that, that we can look at. And if you draw a line, it's actually downward sloping. It's nice. Uh, sorry, it's upward sloping the way I've drawn it. There is a clear relation between what happens in advanced countries and what happens uh, in uh, emerging market countries. So again, you may not be into flags as much as I am, but you know, a big one there, and this, you know, together this is 2.5 billion people, India and China. And as you can see, China is not very far from the line. So another way of saying this in English is that for China, much of the slowdown comes from a decrease in exports, basically. China is not doing badly, except that it's selling less to the rest of the world, and this is, to a first approximation, what has led uh, to lower growth in China. So very strong effect when, when advanced countries do badly, uh, then, then the rest of the world suffers. The other is that emerging market countries are more and more linked uh, through the capital market. So you know, US investors like Brazil, they go to Brazil, they invest, or they don't like Brazil, they get out. And there's an increasing number of countries where uh, one can go. And we are in an environment in which uh, investors change their mind very, very often. Some week, they'll think, you know, Brazil is great. We all go there. And then one week later, there'll be some event that we'll all want to go out. And these movements are enormous. And for a country like Brazil, it's very hard to handle. And when you get these enormous capital flows, what do you do with them? Do you allow your exchange rate to appreciate enormously? Or do you try to intervene to kind of buy the stuff on the other side. Very complicated. And this is, again, a way of giving you a visual impression. So these are the flows from uh, bond funds. So these are funds, think of US funds investing in, in bonds uh, and or investing in equities in emerging market countries. And these are the flows. And what I want you to get from this is just that it moves in the positive part and the negative part with very high frequency. So the result is that it's very difficult for these countries to actually adjust, and that is making their life very difficult. So to a first approximation, these countries really have done nothing wrong. They are just the, 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 the victims of, of what's happening uh, in, uh, in advanced countries. Before I move to policies, let me talk about how things can get worse. <laughs> So, I mean, I've drawn a picture which is no, not great, but it's not dramatic. There is an accelerator, there are three brakes, and well, you hope that the sum of the brakes is less than the accelerator. The problem is that these brakes interact with each other. 
So things can go very, very wrong, right? So this, you know, again, we could spend the rest of the, of the talk on this slide for going for each arrow, but again, the, the idea is very simple. It, suppose you do more fiscal consolidation, right, which you may need to do. Okay, well, this is going to affect growth, right? Uh, it's going to lower growth. Lower growth means you're basically going to get, sorry, this, this is this way, right? Uh, I don't have the arrow the way I want, but start from fiscal consolidation, you do more, this is going to lower growth. Lower growth is going to imply less revenues for the state, you may have to do more fiscal consolidation. Lower growth is going to lead to weaker banks, because when growth is lower, you get more non-performing loans, banks are weaker, they cut credit, this affects growth, right? then the banks are in trouble, and it may be that actually the state has to take over and actually recapitalize them, spend money to do this. This makes the state weaker, right? And then you can kind of, you know, go around as many times as you want, and each of these arrows corresponds to things we've seen during that crisis. Now, things can clearly go very bad. Why is it that, you know, this is so important now, these loops are, are always there, even in good times. I mean, if you do a fiscal consolidation in good times, well, you know, you're going to have an effect on growth. Uh, if growth is weaker, then banks will be weaker. But in the environment in which we are, in which we start with very low growth to start, a lot of fiscal consolidation needed, and weak banks, these arrows can be incredibly strong. This is an environment in which it's very easy to get a bad loop to start. When the economy is healthy, the loop is very weak. Uh, when the economy is what it is, this loop can just happen nearly overnight. And so in this case, what happens is that there can be a very uh, dramatic recession. And that's clearly a risk that policies have to, uh, have to think about. Uh, in, more, in more formal terms, these interactions are very nonlinear. In an economy which is healthy, these interactions are there, but they're not very strong. They become stronger and stronger the uh, less healthy the economy is. So, again, there are many arrows here, all worth discussing, but I shall not discuss them. Good. Let me turn to policies. So, let me first make general statements. I mean, you're in an environment in which, which is the one I've described, you have the accelerator, you have the brakes, you have the risks, what do you do? What is the general message to kind of any country, uh, uh, any advanced country at this point? So, well, first, keep the accelerator on, right? So continue monetary policy, uh, very accommodative monetary policy. Do not increase interest rates. Just go for it. Make sure that uh, you know, the policy rate is as low as possible. Intervene in some markets if you can decrease the rates. This is the only thing at this stage which is really pushing the economy up. You don't want to take it away. There is increasingly the worry that this leads to risks, that some financial institutions think that the riskless rate is basically zero, not terribly attractive, and so are tempted to take risks, which might be unwise. So there's a worry that if we do this for too long, we're going to create a new set of risks in the economy, and then, you know, another crisis. So I think there the answer is not to increase the rates, but it's basically to watch the financial institutions like hawks and make sure that they don't take excessive risk. There's a whole new set of tools uh, which is being developed and increasingly used called macroprudential tools. And these are things like limits, you know, up lower limits on the capital ratio, so that firms have to have enough capital or enough liquidity, uh, which basically make sure, or try to make sure, that the banks and other financial institutions are going to behave. So I think the, con the combination here is continue to have very low rates, just make sure that the financial players don't go back to things that they shouldn't be doing. The, what about the breaks? So break one, again, that's a, a subject of intense debate. Uh, there are people who say fiscal consolidation is crazy, it's killing growth, and so we have to stop, we have to have fiscal stimulus. Uh, this is not, I think, an active discussion in Canada, but it's surely an active discussion in many, in many European countries. And I think there the answer is no. Uh, the levels of debt that these countries have are such that they cannot stay there. It's an incredibly dangerous place to be. Um, 
let me, let, let me tell, basically, let me give you an example, which is something which nearly happened in Italy about a year ago, which is you start with an economy which has 100% debt to GDP, right? Uh, people say, well, the economy is, the, you know, Mr. Monti is in charge, things are good, we trust them, we're going to be willing to lend to them at 1% or 2%, right? So in this case, you have an interest burden, which is 2% times 100%, 2% of GDP, can do it. They wake up one day and they say, well, you know, it may be that it's not going to be so good. It's risky. So we have to ask for a risk premium. We have to ask for 10%, right? Now, when they do this, no matter why they did it, in the process of doing this, now the government has to pay 10% of GDP in interest, which it cannot do, right? So their fears are self-fulfilling. So basically, by believing that it could not pay and asking for unreasonable interest rate, you basically make sure they can't. These are two equilibria. So again, formally, these are called multiple equilibria, but the intuition is fairly clear. And if your level of debt is high, this risk is very high. And that's the reason you don't want to go there. You want to basically decrease the debt. If debt is 20% of GDP to start, that's not an issue. Doubling the interest rate is not an issue. So there has to be fiscal consolidation, but it should not happen too fast. And I think that's one of the lessons of this crisis. You want to do it steadily. Politically, it's hard, because every year you want to do a bit more. Uh, but I think the evidence is if you try to do it very, very quickly, uh, or you're forced to do it because you don't have the financing, which is the case for some program countries, uh, it really is, uh, is, is, is an extremely uh, uh, bad, uh, bad thing to do in terms of, of growth. Break two, continue to repair the financial system, and I think that's happening. I mean, unfortunately, what this means is to a large extent allowing banks to make profits, because this is how they basically get back to better balance sheet, and we have to accept it. Uh, it's happening. Uh, there are still problems, many problems with the financial system. But in the US, I would say, uh, the graph I showed you is probably pessimistic in the sense that now most people can borrow at very low rates. And you don't know if you've tried to get a mortgage, uh, but mortgage rates are very low. Now, there's an immense amount of paperwork <laughs> because the banks are trying to protect themselves. Uh, but in terms of being able to borrow, uh, if, uh, if you can issue bonds, it's cheap. And even if you're a medium-sized firm, you can actually do it. So it is less and less of an issue, but it's still there. It's more of an issue in Europe. There, basically, we just have to continue. Break free is, can you decrease uncertainty? And I think there, there is really kind of uh, large returns to being able to do it, which is that if we can eliminate the uncertainty about the fiscal cliff in the US, I'm quite sure we'll get more growth. If we can get Europe to have a credible plan for the euro and for the various countries, I'm also quite sure that this would have a major effect on demand and, and lead to. So this is a margin, and obviously it's a terribly difficult political margin, but this is a margin at which you can really make things better. I think that if overnight political uncertainty decreased substantially, it would have a very large effect. Let me, so one more. What about the advice to emerging markets and developing economies? Basically, they have done nothing wrong. They just have to be ready to do whatever they need to do in response to shocks. So if, for example, if they export less, maybe they can increase domestic demand. They have to handle capital flows. But to a first approximation, again, they're they are doing the right thing. Let me spend the last two slides on, on the euro, because clearly at this point, this is, this is a, a big issue. So, again, rather than talk about what happened this week, let's try to go back and say, what is wrong with the Eurozone as, a, as an economic construction? What, what, and I think we have learned three things in this crisis. So this is a diagnosis, and then there is a prescription. The first one is the Eurozone was built on the assumption that there would not be very large country-specific shocks. So that basically monetary policy at the center, which has to be the same for all, would basically take care of more shocks. There would not be, Spain would not have an enormous shock relative to the others. Uh, and I think what we've learned is not true. Spain, because it has a housing boom and a housing bust of enormous proportions, uh, it clearly had an asymmetric shock, a country-specific shock. Right? In this case, you can't use monetary policy because it's the same for all, right? so it doesn't work. The second thing we've learned is, that's something that we relearned rather than learned, 
uh, but the Europeans learned, uh, is that there is a feedback loop which is very strong, which is when the economy does poorly, banks do poorly because they have non-performing loans and they stop supplying credit and this makes things worse. So this effect, this amplification by banks is very, very strong. Right. So if you have a bad shock, it makes the bad shock have even larger uh, bad effects. And then the last one is it also makes the fiscal situation very difficult. Right. And we see this in a number of countries. And so the countries, the, the, the governments have to pay high interest rates. This makes it harder to have fiscal consolidation. It creates in the markets the perception that maybe debt will not be repaid. This further increases interest rates and affects not only the government, but in practice, the whole economy. So what we've learned is this is a deadly combination, and basically we have to, uh, to do something about it, or they have to do something about it. So the prescription is, and I think that's a way of interpreting what they're trying to do, the first one is, well, try to avoid the shocks in the first place. You know, in retrospect, it would have been a good idea to tell the Spaniards not to build so much housing. Uh, Will we understand that it's happening next time, or will we make the same mistake? Maybe not. The other point is, well, suppose they have gone into housing, and there was a housing boom, and then there was a housing burst. Maybe they're in so much trouble that they can't make it out on their own, and they need help. They need transfers from the others. And that's an idea which was not there in the construction of the euro. There was no intent to actually help each other, right? except for structural funds, but not cyclically. And so, basically, you may want to have transfer mechanism. If a country is really in trouble, maybe you actually want transfers from the others, so it, it has a better chance of, of surviving. The second is try to avoid the amplification of banks. So try to have a mechanism in which the banks can be recapitalized without this be becoming a debt of the government. Right? So this is the whole project about the banking union uh, which is uh, taking place. And then, the last one is try to have a fiscal position so that the probability that you know, debt is not repaid is very small because it is, it is clearly a very costly thing for the economy when it happens. So this is why they are working on these projects called the banking union, the fiscal union. But in practice, the issue is a political one, which is that all these imply the possibility of transfers, of basically helping people in trouble, countries which are in trouble. And you can see why there's a great reluctance to do so the Germans think that the Greeks have misbehaved, so why should they be helped, and so on and so on. But that's what they are trying to do. Now let me talk about the short run. In the short run, Greece is a bit of a sideshow. It's a small country. It's 2% it's of Euro GDP. Right. The countries which really matter are Spain and Italy in terms of importance, and that's where we want things to uh, go well. So. What's happening here? Well, what is needed? I mean, you have a country uh, like uh, Spain, uh, and it has two problems. It has a problem of competitiveness, because prices have increased too much, so it needs to reestablish this. It has a fiscal problem, right? So it has to have a plan in which it adjusts competitiveness through structural reforms, through uh, decreases in wages, that's one, and then a fiscal adjustment, fiscal consolidation. Okay. That's the first condition. So all countries in trouble have to do that. They are doing it. I mean, if you actually look, if you look at Spain, if you look at Italy, or if you look at you know, Ireland before, and so on and so on, these are countries which are taking really strong measures to try to get out of the hole. Okay. But that's not enough, again. They may not be able to do it on their own, and that's where the euro area level uh, decisions matter, which is, the first is, if they have to recapitalize their banks, and they have to do this through the governments, then this means a very large increase in the debt of governments because they have to finance it. And they're already starting from very high debt. So when they do this, the markets are going to say, these are crazy levels of debt. So they are working on something called direct recapitalization of banks so that the money from the uh, euro members would go directly, would be lent directly to the banks, not to the government and then to the banks. So this would not increase the debt of a government. So that's a very important thing. The, the second is this multiple equilibria, which I refer to, which is even if you have a country which is behaving very well, if the markets wake up thinking that it's not going to work, then they are going to ask for a very high interest rate, and the country is going to go bust, no matter how serious, responsible it was. So this is what has been 
changed by the creation of something called OMT, and there are many acronyms in that in that uh, any acronyms in that business. But something which has been created by the central bank, uh, the Euro Central Bank, the ECB, and basically it says if you have a program in which you've basically indicated what you're going to do and you're doing it, then we'll basically intervene in the market for your bonds, your sovereign bonds, and we'll make sure the interest rate is not too high. So they eliminate this possibility that the interest rate would just jump and kill the program. And that has been offered, and that makes an enormous difference, right? And then the condition for this to happen, unfortunately, is that the pro uh, countries have to accept to be in programs. And so far, if you follow the events, neither Spain nor Italy has been willing to do so, but they have not needed to do it. So it's happening. I think the, the bottom line is it's happening, but as anything in Europe, it's happening slowly and messily, but it's happening. The conclusion... <laughs> no, I, I should have had a slide, uh, but where do I stand? I mean, going back to kind of, you know, will the crisis last forever? Uh, I'm reasonably optimistic. I mean, I don't think you know, all countries are going to succeed and there are going to be crises along the way and so on. But my sense is, again, when I think about this accelerator breaks, uh, we're thinking about it, I think that eventually private demand is going to pick up for the reasons I've explained. It's still not going to be great because fiscal consolidation is going to continue. My trip policy is going to have more and more effects. So I think that advanced countries can hope to basically increase their growth rate slowly and get back to health. But along the way, some countries are going to find it very difficult and there will be more crises. But the crisis will end. <laughs> it's a good way of ending that, uh, that presentation. Good. I'm done. <laughs> so I understand there are questions, right? So, uh, If I may, Olivier, uh, ask a question. Um, in your policy prescription, uh, you mentioned a number of ideas to address the crisis. Um, you didn't raise the issue of a, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, which is uh, an issue that's come up in, the, in light of the crisis. Uh, some people are saying the world needs a Chapter 11 sort of a process for, to come, help come countries out of debt because there is no rational process that's shared and understood all around the world. What is your opinion on a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism? So there are various parts to, um, to the answer to that question. I think at a very general level, it would be good to have a debt restructuring mechanism for sovereign debt. Um, and, and those of you who, again, follow events closely know that there was a ruling by a judge in New York last week on Argentine debt, which is throwing all kinds of uh, doubts about whether we uh, actually have a functioning one. Um, this is something that the fund uh, tried to push maybe 15 years ago called the SDRM. I think it would be very good to have such a, such a system in place. Not necessarily to use it, but that it's ready. In the same way as we have, you know, Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 uh, for corporations. I think it would make a whole lot of sense. The reluctance comes largely from the fact that countries do not want to admit that they even think about it. And as a result, uh, it's, it's not happening. More concretely, uh, should we basically be considering uh, debt restructuring for, uh, uh, for, for various countries at this stage in Europe? And you know, I think the, the belief is that, except for Greece, the countries have a hard way up, but not an impossible way up, and therefore it's worth trying and avoiding uh, any kind of debt restructuring. Uh, for Greece, the issue is, 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 is harder because the level of debt is very high. So although there hasn't been debt restructuring, uh, I think the Europeans have understood that the Greeks need a break. And so the way uh, it came out uh, last week is that they basically made interest rate reductions rather than, uh, than, than a straight debt restructuring. Uh, that's where they were willing to, uh, to go. They also have indicated that if this is not enough and Greece behaves and follows the program and, 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 and tries to do all the things it has promised to do, then they might, be, uh, cons they might consider more. Uh, that's where we are. Um, 
But at some general level, it is, it is a bit of a taboo topic for reasons I understand, uh, which makes it difficult to, to make progress on. Um, I have a question about um, the uh, <clears throat> debt forgiveness. Uh, the London School of Economics has uh, made some recommendations about debt forgiveness just in the Eurozone. And it seems to me that this might be a way of uh, getting us out of the mess. Um, have you done any work on this, or is the IMF an advocate of this uh, strategy? And if so, what uh, dynamics could be deployed to start it um, going? I missed the last sentence. What oh. dynamics might be? Um, what dynamics could you see uh, happening around the world to make this happen? Look, in general, I think the, 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 the working principle is if countries can repay their debt, they should, the same way as people should repay their debt. Uh, you know, it's too easy to just get out of debt. So uh, it, it's clear that there is a great reluctance to think about uh, debt restructuring or debt forgiveness, uh, which, are, which are largely the same thing. Uh, and I go back to my previous answer, which is that uh, in the case of Greece, there was no willingness to forgive debt, but there was willingness to go somewhere uh, by decreasing the interest rate. That's where the Europeans are. Um, and. Uh, that's where we are. Yes, please. Uh, on this side. Uh, you showed in one of your charts the VIX indicators, and you showed them very, very low, low uh, measures of, of, of fright. Um, and, and as well, we've seen, at least here in North America, fairly strong stock markets. Uh, assume that those two things uh, are indicators that we are just about to have very good recovery, a recovery that no one is anticipating. My question is, what tools do central bankers have to reduce all of this liquidity that they've put into the system uh, so that we don't have high inflation in four or five years? I, I understand that there's no sign of inflation today whatsoever, but, but assume things turn out a lot better than, pe than, than we anticipate. Yeah, I, I don't see this as a major issue. I mean, if they had bought assets which could not be resold, then that would be a serious issue because it would be on their balance sheet and they couldn't get rid of it. Uh, but if the economy starts picking up, which I very much hope and I think is not inconceivable, and so we have higher growth, it may be that they, um, you know, they, they can use the usual tools. They can increase the interest rate, and this will slow down things, and they can do this. And they can basically sell many of the assets that they bought along the way so as to reduce the, uh, the money supply at the right speed. So my, my sense is it's, these, are, these are not uh, difficult uh, policies or positions to get out of. Uh, it would be an issue if you're stuck with something on a balance sheet that you can't get rid of, but I don't think that's the case. And I wish, you know, this was our problem, that basically we had such strong growth that we needed to think about exiting. Uh, hopefully we get there, but that's uh, not around the corner yet. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Um, I'm wondering how you can say that the crisis will be over eventually because the causes of the crisis, the 30-year economic regime of deregulation, uh, constant stero uh, keens on steroids, but calling it uh, you know, supply-side economics, those are all in place. I mean, you have a fiscal crisis everywhere around the world because the, uh, the real economy has been transferred to the developing economies. So now that much, uh, much, much of what used to be the considered the rich, rich world or the first world is delving into uh, a, a downward spiral of, delt, of debt. I mean, the average Canadian has 160% debt ratio when previously it used to be 80%. Uh, previously, you know, the average person on one income could have twice the number of kids and have a very comfortable middle, middle class life was the norm. 
Now it's becoming shorter and shorter through only the few, uh, the top percent can have a reasonably well-equipped life on one income. Um, uh, you know, our policies of deregulation, Glass-Steagall, uh, Keynes on steroids, but, call, but spinning it as supply side, uh, transferring your wealth from North America and Europe uh, to Asia so that they have to import, I mean, now they're consuming wealth without producing it, leading to the constant imbalances. I mean, everything is, is impossible from a structural level for these countries to get back on their feet. I mean, the whole cause of the fiscal crisis, of the fiscal cliff, is a recognition that without constant, to be, that the American economy has become so hollowed out that without constant stimulation, that if they actually get fiscally responsible, it'll, it'll have the whole thing implode down on them, and that they can't risk actually being fiscally responsible because that will crash the economy. And the, and the second thing is, what, could we, instead of adopting the fiscal policies, could you not solve the problems by being more creative with your central bank? Instead of the taxpayer coming up with the money, when the central bank can just as easily move a, move a computer mouse, uh, you know, three inches and create three trillion euros, you know, uh, would it not be better that way? Uh, have them write off the debt and then have them fund perhaps by equity? So that the banks are back in a strong fiscal position by, by debt, by zero rate interest rate economic policy from the central bank creating money, and let the uh, let the governments just uh, slowly write down some of their debts. So you've got a win-win-win. I mean. It would take a while to answer all of your questions. <laughs> Let me say let me say a few things. Um, I have not made the statement that we were going back to bliss. Uh, I have not offered solutions for global warming yet. Uh, there are problems in the world. There are very serious problems in the world, uh, which are there and and will remain. So, for example, I think the, the issue of uh, income inequality, which was probably aggravated by the crisis, but it's, you know, was there long before and, and will still be with us after. It's a very major issue. So again, we have to handle this in some way. So it's a very big issue. So it's not the topic of my talk, but it is a very big issue. The financial system, uh, I've said, you know, for the US, banks are lending again. That's true. But at the same time, the financial system remains extremely risky, extremely complex, extremely risky. And it's a very difficult uh, task to make it less risky uh, because when you deal with a financial system or with a financial institutions, when you put a regulation in place and it's not quite the right one, then the other side sees an uh, opportunity for arbitrage and then you have to change the regulation and you're playing against people who are very, very smart. So I, I would think that financial risks will, will remain. Now, so all kinds of things are not going to be fixed anytime soon, if, if ever. Uh, what I argued was a more limited argument, which is that there was a way to return to decent levels of unemployment, uh, decent growth rates, uh, even with fiscal consolidation. So that's where we disagree. I think that countries can get out of a debt burden. It takes many years. Uh, much discipline, but it has happened many times in the past. I think it can happen again. Um, on your simple solution, uh, which is let's print money and be done, uh, it's true that we could overnight print money and distribute it to this audience like this, but it would generate inflation, and inflation would take away uh, purchasing power from a large number of people, for example, the people are bondholders, the retirees. So, and we do not think that inflation, I do not think that inflation is the solution at this point. But, you know, there are many other points you've raised, so we could go on. Yeah. Well, I have two questions. Has the private economy or learn the lesson, because there were actually two crises. One was in around 2007, where 
banks were happily lending money for mortgages, even though it looked like a bubble. And then this sort of blew up at the time of Lehman, and then everyone was still happy lending to Greece and Portugal and those other countries. So somehow the alarm was not there. Now the problems, of course, got much bigger. So the question is, can we sort of count on private bankers to have learned the lesson and become more careful? Or is it something that has to be done through macroprudential regulation? And the second question is, you know, in retrospect, would you think that 4% inflation would have been a better uh, target to allow more room for monetary policy? Good. Let me answer the second one. I said so in writing, and I still believe it. The, um, it's not, again, that's not that I love inflation, so let me be clear about, there are many arguments which are made in favor of high inflation, and some of them strike me as wrong. For example, using inflation at this stage to decrease the value of the debt strikes me as not the right thing, because it would affect, in terms of income distribution, it would affect retirees and people we do not want. So I, I'm absolutely not in favor of this. The argument was different, and it's not relevant today, it's relevant for the future, maybe, which is that what we have learned is that an economy gets into the liquidity trap, you lose an instrument, which is a precious instrument. Now, if you start with higher average inflation and therefore higher interest rates, higher nominal rates, then you have more room to play with. So when there's an adverse shock, you can use, you have more room to uh, decrease the interest rate. This I still believe. Now, as you know, if you followed that, many people have disagreed, said that moving from 2% inflation to 4% inflation would decrease the credibility of central banks and various issues. But I think on its own, the argument I gave uh, still holds. Um, on your point before that, yeah, I think there are two different crises. Uh, there is kind of a Lehman crisis, which is US-centered to start and, and, the financial, and focused on the financial system. And then you have the Euro crisis, which is a rather different beast. They have interacted, and this, the second has interacted with the first, but these are different, uh, different crises uh, with, different, with different implications. The, you said, should we hope that the bankers will have learned, or do we need regulation? Uh, I think I'm on, of the school that uh, we need regulation uh, without much ambiguity. Ah, yeah, let, me take, let, let me make sure that there's nobody on the other side. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there? Okay. Okay. Then. Uh, my question concerns uh, capital account regulation. Um, Is what? Capital account regulation. Um, surely, once a shock materializes, um, what Professor Stiglitz calls hot money pr can proceed to exacerbate shocks. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent is capital account regulation, i.e., capital controls, such as Tobin tax, on the table right now in discussions? And secondly, to what extent do you think capital account regulation could play? a good role, a strong, a positive role uh, in sort of uh, in, in financial regulatory architecture. Okay. Uh, that's a softball because as you may or may not know, we have worked a lot and I have worked a lot on capital controls in the last uh, three years. So I think the crisis has convinced many people who were not convinced before that we can have these very sharp shifts in investor preferences leading them to reallocate funds, uh, which may not be fully rational, which may be subject to herding or various things like this. And I think the notion that capital flows are always and everywhere a good thing is no longer the standard belief. Uh, steady capital flows, foreign direct investment, sure, but the, the, the shorter maturity flows, I think, are now seen as a mixed blessing. And so in that context, the fund has developed a position over the years which says that to the extent that capital flows lead to potential risks in the financial system or in the macroeconomy, uh, then it is okay if you don't have other tools to actually uh, use capital controls to limit uh, the flows. So I think the position today is, in many cases, what you want to do is probably not use capital controls. You want to make your financial system more robust, higher capital ratios, higher liquidity ratios, and so on and so on. But 
if having done this, you still have very large capital inflows and, or capital outflows and are likely to create problems, then our position has been, yes, you can use capital controls. I think, I think they are there to stay. I believe that was the final question. I'm sorry I didn't take, there was one question here which I didn't, no, on the, on the screen, which I didn't take, but no, it, it says that was the final question, so I <laughs> <laughs> cannot do it. All right, sure, please do. Um, well, it does seem to me like the, the crux of the issue is that the, um, the first world economy has to a large extent been shipped off to the third world, if you want to call China that, and that the, um, the first world financial system has devolved into um, um, a kind of wild west version of a casino in which the rules aren't clearly understood but um, when they do come up, all the players are caught flat-footed. Um, and as I'm not a capitalist, I do feel that this process uh, is one that I, would, I have not signed up for. So it seems to me that people are, are running these massive capital exchanges that have massive effects on the, on the general populace and it's kind of like a Wild West show in which only the people with uh, pop guns get to call the rules. And so you are in effect asking the populace to, like the Americans have to pay an incredible amount of money, which I think is in fact mm, impossible for them to pay up, um, to pay off the debts which they neither signed up for and probably wouldn't have asked for in the first place. So I'm not sure if they're actually willing or able to do that. So that, is that a question? How do you expect them to do that? Uh, I'm not sure that's a question. I think that's more of a statement. But the, let me say a few things. And, and again, you know, these are, these are obviously uh, issues on which one can disagree. Uh, a general point. Nobody is forced to take debt on. There's always a creditor and a debtor. So accusing only the person who, who lent seems often to be, to be a bit extreme. The, the, more, the more general point is I think you have to have a, a more balanced view of a financial system. Um, and you know, I have no, no stake in it, I've never been part of it and so on. But the financial system plays a very fundamental role. And it plays a fundamental role because partly of its complexity of allowing firms to eliminate risk, hedge against risk, uh, transfer risk. These functions are terribly important. Uh, so the notion that it's all the Wild West and you know, we should get rid of it just doesn't cut it. At the same time, it is absolutely true uh, that there are enormous excesses. So that what you get in terms of risk diversification comes at the cost of behavior which is too risky or uh, you know, incomes which are too high. So I think that the reasonable position is not to say, well, let's get rid of it because we can't. Uh, we need it, uh, but it's trying to regulate it. But what, going back to a question which was asked earlier, I think it's terribly difficult. I mean, if I look at Dodd Frank, which is, uh, you know, the attempt in the US to, to do that, um, it's very, very hard to regulate a very complex financial system. So I think that's the tension we're going to live with for the rest of our lives, uh, which is that on the one hand, the system is going to perform very useful functions, uh, but on the other hand, uh, some people somewhere are going to misbehave or are going to take advantage of some regulation which is not well designed. I think we have to accept it. I think that's the way the world is. But I would reject, uh, you know, this is a Wild West environment in which we should just get rid of these guys and do without. Uh, the world is a complex place. This was the last question. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. You can have a seat and I'll uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here to thank our speaker and just give a couple of quick notes at the end. 
I'd like to thank Olivier Blanchard for taking us on a roller coaster ride, frankly. Uh, not only did he change the name of the presentation, uh, but then after promising only a couple of very scary slides, he actually went on to show a whole tornado of risks and vicious cycles. Um, but in the end, uh, he offered us some very uh, practical policy prescriptions to address those risks, to uh, mitigate the, the, the crisis, and to uh, move us forward to a period of growth again. And as you'll recall, he did assert that the crisis will end. So I think uh, we can get off the roller coaster safely now and uh, thank him once again for a very good discussion. Thank you. I'd also like to thank David Johnson of Laurier for bringing Olivier Blanchard here and helping to set that up. I know that uh, you have many students here and other of your colleagues in the faculty have also brought students here. And I think now in future when you ask uh, what was your best economics course and uh, who was your favorite teacher, they like you can say it was Olivier Blanchard. So uh, just before we go, I'd like to... Um, Thank everyone in the audience for being here and including those online and mention that our next event in the CG Auditorium takes place next week, Thursday, December 6th. It's a lecture presented by the museum in Kitchener-Waterloo uh, as part of the exhibit on James Cameron's film Avatar. Uh, CG and the museum present Blue Language, Exploring Navi, Avatar's Native Voice. And you can purchase tickets for that event through the museum's uh, website, www.themuseum.ca. Be sure to register for CG's events newsletter for information on our free public events. And finally, thank you again to 570 News and Wordsworth Books for sponsoring this lecture series. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe journey home. <laughs>